Today I want to talk about the existence of an afterlife world and how we should live. First of all, all of you ensure your lives. What do you do it for? Do you do it for the benefit of your relatives, in case you die, or because if you have an accident, there are insurances for injuries as well, you can't live without coverage. I think the same way you should reflect on the afterlife world. One such reflection is as follows. If one assumes that there is no afterlife world, then there is no point in persistently preparing for it. However, if an after-death world does exist, then we think it would be terrible to be unprepared for it. Imagine a man with worldly attachments. He thinks this world is everything to him. He thinks that indulging in pleasures in this life is a good thing. He claims that there is no world after death. Of course, such a person in this life will completely squander the merit by which he was born as a human being. Therefore, if an afterlife world exists, an unhappy afterlife awaits him, which is analogous to being in an accident without prior life insurance. I think you understand this as well. So now let's turn to the question of what the afterlife is like. There's a big difference between what different teachings say about it. Here's something to think about. Imagine two paths. Here are two paths, and each of those who believe in one path or the other defends the existence of one or the other. As for the first path, however, neither the founder of the religious organization nor its members have followed it to the end. Nevertheless, they say that this path exists. It can be compared to the path that leads to the precipice, when many people, not knowing the end of the path and blindly believing in it, rushed along it. And there is another path, the path that I took. The path my disciples are following. It is analogous to the fact that first there is a person who has already reached the end goal of the path, then there is an exact map, which many other people use, who understand what the destination is. We believe that the first way is the wrong religion, and the second way is the religion of truth. I think it is this way of thinking that is the dispassionate scientific way of thinking. Next. If one considers that one is reborn, does this mean that happiness in the worldly life is something completely meaningless to us? On this point, Sakyamuni preached two teachings, the first for laymen, and the second for monks. Since our world, born out of the cycle of being, is full of suffering, since it is a world where, even if there is happiness, it will, in any case, be destroyed, we may say that the best, highest happiness is to distance oneself from this world and transcend it. However, there is another case. Your soul has not yet matured to this realization, but since this world of phenomena, this real world, exists, you want to live here better and happier. In that case, even though this happiness is impermanent, if its background is truth, then practicing truth to achieve worldly happiness will not be meaningless. Sakyamuni also suggested this. But why did Sakyamuni suggest this path after all, even though happiness is impermanent here? The fact is that if your happiness has truth as its background, then of course in the next life you will also be immersed in a world of happiness against the background of truth. And then, because in the next life, you will practice the truth again, the deeper meaning of which you could not understand in this life, you will make your soul even more mature. And if in the next life, you don't move away from the truth, in the next life your soul will become even more mature. That is how one day you will aspire to liberation. That is why Sakyamuni, with a soul similar to that of a parent, of course wishing that those who follow this path should lead a life of more ease than suffering, preach the path of a happy life in the world and rebirth in the high worlds in the next life. But keep in mind that the condition for this is the continuous flow of life against the background of truth. What is the best way to do this? Whatever it is, it is important to create a strong strong karmic connection with truth. Well, what is necessary to create a strong strong karmic connection with truth? Still, it is a sacrifice of the law and persistent effort. Of course, in addition to that, one needs the sacrifice of property, the sacrifice of contentment, and the observance of the commandments. But I think the main methods for keeping a person from the truth are the sacrifice of the law and perseverance. 
If you want to live materially richer, in a practical sense, then the sacrifice of property for the truth will be very powerful. And if you want to live with a peaceful soul, then the sacrifice of tranquility, in which you kindly communicate with people based on truth, will have wonderful power. Then, if you want to lead always a vigorous and stable life, both physically and mentally, then the observance of the five or ten commandments, through which the practitioner tries to preserve energy and purify himself, will bring wonderful benefits. And to succeed in life, one must strengthen the will as it is written in the Buddhist sutras and as I and my disciples and believers do to achieve results. It is this strengthening of the will that brings to the practitioner the benefit of success in life. Let us put the truth into practice as best we can, so that as many people as possible can get acquainted with this information. Please like it, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment of 8 words or more.